warm welcome to this week's special edition of Environment where we're 500 kilometres off the African coast on the island of Madagascar. It doesn't take long to realise that this is a place of exceptional flora and fauna. Around 90% of its plant species are found nowhere else in the world, making it an extraordinary setting for this week's show. Coming up, Madagascar's Rosewood Crisis. We take you to the depths of the Maswala National Park, where illegal exploitation is ravaging this precious resource. Next, we head west to the village of Ampasiputs, where there's plenty of sunshine, but not nearly enough energy. How can solar power change the locals' way of life? And finally, a new expedition, a new discovery. Scientists explore the island's unknown marine world. Since a military coup in 2009, many of Madagascar's most rare and precious resources have become primary targets in a secretive world of illegal exploitation. Perhaps at greatest risk is the country's species of rosewood trees, which are being pillaged from poorly protected forests, like here in Moswala, and exported mainly to China. Morin Setra's worst kept secret lies hardly hidden in a dusty yard in this riverside town. Several hundred rosewood logs, sorted, numbered, ready for sale. Our guide Paul has brought us to this massive stockpile, risking the wrath of the timber barons should they learn he's led us here. The landowner and his security guard have heard of our arrival. Reluctantly, he agrees to show us around, he insists this rosewood is legal. The stock here is almost certainly bound for China. It's not found outside of Madagascar. It's going to disappear. It's very beautiful. It's good to make chairs and lots of things because it lasts for a long time. Rosewood is a sensitive and controversial subject in Madagascar. For the most part, it's illegal to export the precious resource, except when cyclones ravage the coast. Only then does the government temporarily lift a ban and allow already destroyed timber to be cut and traded. It makes it virtually impossible to know the truth behind each log. This site here is where the wood's sold. Someone buys it from here. Then it goes to another port in Namambia, where there's a huge boat waiting for the timber to be loaded and exported overseas. Paul agrees to take us to the heart of the problem, an hour and a half away by boat to the Maswala National Park. In 2009, China imported 140 million euros worth of illegal rosewood from these forests over a period of just a few months. Ambo de Fora is a village on the fringe of the park. It's also a known recruiting ground for able-bodied men willing to chop the hardwood. The village chief says the government is complicit. It even negotiates with the Chinese bosses who want to place the timber orders, typically between five and ten tonnes per month. The minister's people block the Chinese who want to come and exploit the forest. They say, you stay here and we'll receive the wood. Afterwards, we will give it to you. While the ministry takes a cut, his people, he says, are left with nothing. Men here are paid 5,000 ari ari per day, less than two euros to carry out the back-breaking work. It's the young people who do it. We're old and stay in the village. It's the young people, those who still have the strength. We find someone to take us to see Rosewood here first thing tomorrow morning. It will be a two-hour trek. The precious timber is increasingly hard to find. Sami is a father of four. He knows the forest by heart, and more importantly, he knows where to find the rosewood. The terrain is rough, the humidity stifling. 
finally, we come across the rich red hue of rosewood shavings. Evidence logging has occurred nearby. 20 metres away, there's an abandoned stump. The loggers take six or seven metres. They leave the rest there. Look, we can see what's left of the trunk. The loggers have left behind the top of the trunk. They have no interest. It's not large enough to sell. Deeper in the forest, we come across a much larger stump. It's here that Sammy admits he has cut down trees in the past. It's really difficult. For example, in rough terrain, we need to first cut smaller logs to hold the tree trunk in place. And then there are those who have to lift it and those who have to pull. This villager says he no longer accepts the work. He wants his children to know and appreciate their land. But he too believes the authorities are benefiting from the trade. He tells us their so-called raids are often announced a day in advance. The timber bosses receive a warning from officials in Maroncetra. The bosses then leave us with money to pay the police. And we've never had any problems with the police. We think it's because they're receiving lots of money. Back in Morincetro, we put the question to the head of the National Park, a post appointed by the government. He agrees there's corruption but says he plays no part. Did I take money? No. Corruption? No. Money has been proposed to me in the past. It was someone who worked in the timber industry. He proposed it in an indirect manner to see whether I would be interested. The government, meanwhile, says it stepped up efforts to halt exploitation. A few days after we left the town, there was a major military operation. Authorities say they seized around 900 illegal logs. <laughs> Deforestation in general is not a new problem in Madagascar. Locals have long needed timber to cook on a fireplace or use as a source of light. But slowly greener forms of energy are being introduced to these communities, with solar power proving capable of changing their life. The sun beats down mercilessly on the village of Ampasiputz. All the better for the local hospital whose solar panelled roof soaks up the rays. Inside where it's cooler, a local doctor gives a young patient a checkup. A suppository is needed. She heads to the refrigerator that runs on solar power and proudly produces the medication. There's medicine, some suppositories. It's often hot here, very hot. The suppositories could melt, so we have to put them in the refrigerator. Solar panels haven't just made administering vaccines in the town easier, they've also helped out hospital staff. Midwives here used to work by candlelight. This is the maternity area. There are lights in here, so when a woman gives birth, there are no problems. It's like we're in the city. Ampasiputz is a showcase village for the solar energy industry. On the edge of town, a team of French engineers are using the technology to tackle one of the greatest challenges in this dry, isolated region, obtaining drinking water. At an average rate of 6 kilowatts per hour per square meter, this should in theory make about 15 cubic meters of water per day. A few final turns of the screw and crystal clear water gurgles to the surface from 40 meters below ground. It's enough to provide water for up to 50 villagers every day. On central Madagascar's arid plains, water is a rare and precious commodity. And not everyone in the valley is as lucky as the residents of Ampasiputz. Less than a kilometre away, we meet Fadja on her way to the local well. She makes the trek every day, working the pump manually to fill her two containers. There are no foreign investors to come to the rescue here. Instead, Fadja and her husband have to make do with what they have. 
We've seen others buy small solar panels. They cost at least 100 euros. It would light the house, but we can't afford it. In fact, even the smallest solar panels can cost upwards of 750 euros, an exorbitant sum on a continent where 70% of the population lives beneath the poverty line. This is where the national park meets the sea. But the rich biodiversity doesn't end here. Madagascar's marine life is among the most unique in the world. And scientists at Paris's Museum of Natural History believe there's still thousands of species unknown. Large-scale nature expeditions are back, under the watchful eye of these Malagasy fishermen. The Natural History Museum scientists are combing the island's ocean floors and beaches in search of new species. It's here, on the other side. It's impossible to draw up an entire who's who of the sea world. It's estimated that 80% of marine life is still unknown, despite the new discoveries that are made each year. Finding fish that measure several meters is becoming rare. But that's not the case for small invertebrates, crustaceans and mollusks. Deep sea or tropical fishing explorers always return to the surface with dozens or even hundreds of unknown species. Some sea species spread quicker than others. The champion breeders, crustaceans, simple organisms that reproduce easily. Next come mollusks, followed by fish. But new changes to the ecosystem worry scientists. Here numbers of jellyfish are up, but only because overfishing is killing off their natural predators. A recent report to the UN warned that a killer cocktail of climate change, overfishing and pollution could spell extinction for many species. Sadly, it's time to leave this magnificent island. It's been a pleasure having you with us here on France Van Cat and we'll see you next time.